Hi, good evening and welcome to our first public lecture, lecture in our winter spring 2021 webinar series. As Laura said, my name is Amy Merkel and I'm a research scientist at LASP in addition to our current lead for our Office of Communications. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to our presenter this evening, Dr. Fran Baganall. Dr. Baganall was born and raised in the UK and received her bachelor's degree in physics and geophysics from the University of Lancaster, England. In 1981, she earned her doctorate degree in earth and planetary sciences from MIT in Cambridge, Mass. She then spent five years as a postdoctoral researcher at the Imperial College in London before returning back to the United States to begin her amazing career in planetary exploration as both a researcher and professor at the University of Colorado here in Boulder. Dr. Baganall has participated in many of NASA's planetary exploration missions, including Voyager 1 and 2, Galileo, Deep Space 1, and New Horizons. Currently, she is a co-investigator and team leader of the plasma investigations on NASA's Juno mission, mission to Jupiter, and will be giving us an update on Jupiter's great red spot this evening. Thank you, Dr. Baganall, for joining us this evening. I'll now turn the presentation over to you. Good evening. Let me share my screen, and then you can see what we're going to talk about. So what we're going to do is to talk about the Great Red Spot. Now, I am not an atmospheric scientist. My research is on charged particles that are trapped in the magnetic field of Jupiter rather than the atmosphere and atmospheric chemistry and dynamics and so on. But I've been watching what's been happening to the Great Red Spot and I thought, this is cool, this is neat, this is interesting. Let me share this with the public because I think there's a lot of general interest in the Great Red Spot. So this is in fact, perhaps the most uh, famous meteorological feature of the solar system. There are no other planets that have atmospheric phenomena quite like the Great Red Spot. And so um, this is one of the reasons why it's totally cool. And it's been observed for over 190 years. So let's do, to start with, a bit of Jupiter 101. What's the basics on uh, bits about Jupiter itself? And so let's start off with that and um, think about Jupiter orbits the sun every 12 years and uh, it's at a distance, five times the distance away from the sun that the earth orbits the sun. It's uh, much bigger than the earth. It has a radius of about uh, 11 times that of the earth. So you can see the scales here. And the mass is about 318 times the mass of the earth. So this is a big planet. If we take it and map it out, you can see here um, the stripes, we call those belts and zones. The, the, the orangey colors and the white ones and the great red spot right there. Let me show you a movie that was made by Cassini uh, as it was flying uh, past Jupiter on its way to Saturn. And it took these amazing pictures and you can see in this movie, the belts and zones going in different directions. And you can see the great red spot in there uh, swirling about. You also see a bunch of other spots. Now the other spots come and go on months to a, uh, weeks of uh, time scale, whereas the Great Red Spot has been observed for a long time uh, and seems to be persistent. But it's changing, and that's what we'll talk about today. So let's think about what we're looking at when we look at the atmosphere of Jupiter. We're looking here at a layer of clouds, and those clouds are in fact ammonia clouds. Now the cloud deck is actually at a pressure, atmospheric pressure, that's common, very similar to the atmospheric pressure that we're breathing in the sky right now here on the surface of Earth. And so the cloud deck is about one Earth pressure or one bar. What we're actually seeing though, the top is we're seeing ammonia clouds, clouds of ammonia. So instead of water, we see ammonia at Jupiter. And instead of breathing nitrogen and oxygen as we do in Earth's atmosphere, most of the atmosphere of Jupiter is hydrogen and helium. Okay, very different atmosphere. Now underneath that layer of ammonia ice, we think there's another layer of ammonia hydrosulfide. So that's ammonia with some sulfur mixed in. And below that, we think there's a layer of water. And below that, 
there's a liquid interior of um, mostly hydrogen with some other pieces mixed in. So that's the general idea of what we think we're looking at. Now, why are the clouds red? Why is the great red spot red? We're going to talk about that. We'll come back to that in a minute. Let's think a little bit about what it's like inside Jupiter. This is the view before Juno. I'm not going to talk a lot about the interior. Juno has learned a lot about the interior from making measurements. But we do know that the hydrogen gets very compressed. And so um, we have a region where it's metallic. And that's where the dynamo is generated. So it's electrically conducting the magnetic dynamo deep inside the uh, center of Jupiter. And above that, we have a region that is mostly molecular hydrogen. Um, and, and we don't really understand the structure. When we think about the meteorology, the, the, the weather layer, if you like, the outermost layer, they're very thin compared with the rest of the planet. And um, we know there's some motions deep down inside, but how far the connections between these regions, we don't really quite understand. Just for reference, the bulk density of Jupiter is about four times that of the Earth. Uh, sorry, a quarter of that of the Earth. The Earth is rock and metal and so much more dense. Um, but the gravity, the net gravity at the top, uh, even though Jupiter is 318 times the mass of the Earth, when you get out far, the gravity is less. And so it's uh, down to two and a 2.7 times that of the Earth. So in fact, those conditions in the meteorology in the upper atmosphere is not too different from the conditions we have here in the Earth's atmosphere. Now, these belts and zones, these regions of east and west flowing um, uh, clouds, uh, have various names that have been given these, these categories. I'm not going to make too much deal about this, except please note that the great red spot down um, two thirds of the way down is between the south equatorial belt and the south temperate belt, um, south of the equatorial region. And we'll be talking more about that in a minute. When we look at the wind speeds, we can watch the clouds moving and measure the wind speeds in the atmosphere. And what we find is that they're really strong. And so we have wind speeds of 300 miles an hour. So that's sort of hurricane force um, wind speeds. Um, mostly going off that way. Uh, and um, you can see um, there's a belts and zones, they go in different directions. So what we have here is that the uh, convection inside Jupiter, the atmospheric convection is driven by internal heat. It's not driven by the sun further away. So five times further away, 25 times five squared weaker sunlight. But the other thing is that Jupiter being so big, it's like a big hot potato and retains its heat compared with a little pea that cools off quickly. So the big hot potato planet has retained all of its heat of formation from when it was made. All that mass coming together makes a lot of heat. It takes a long time to cool off. And so most of the convection and the weather we see at Jupiter is driven from the inside. And we see these alternate belts and zones with the zones being the area where, where um, uh, dry, sorry, mo moist, warm air goes up and high pressure region above and the belts where um, you have dry colder air sinking. So of course, we also have to think about rotation. Rotation is important for planetary atmospheres. And here we compare the Earth, which spins every 24 hours, with say Venus, which takes 243 days to spin around once, and Jupiter, which spins every 10 hours. So rotation is obviously very important on Jupiter. Now, when we look at the belts and zones on Jupiter, the movie I'm showing again below, when we compare it with the Earth, you see the Earth also has belts and zones. And the clouds, the water clouds, which is shown here in white, you can see they come and go. Um, they seem to be going to the left, going to the right, east and west winds. Um, but because the Earth has continents, you see that these winds, belts and zones get disrupted by the continents. It's harder for the winds to go over the mountains. And so they get deflected. And there's a change in the moisture as it goes over the oceans compared to the dry land, so on and so forth. So the Earth's climate and indeed the daily weather system is very complicated. And so 
um, you can see Earth's weather. We do have belts and zones. We have fewer belts and zones than Jupiter, and it's complicated by the existence of uh, oceans and continents. And so when we, what we find is that the faster rotation, you get more belts and zones for Jupiter and more circulation cells. So um, similar, but uh, different, quantitatively different. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the Great Red Spot. And we can go back to Galileo Galilei, one of the first people to use a telescope to look at the sky. And he of course noted that the moon was full of craters very, uh, not a beautiful sphere, but covered with what looked like um, blemishes. He saw four large moons orbiting Jupiter. And uh, that of course was very important. They're now called the Galilean moons, Eo, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. But he also saw a spot on Jupiter. What was it? We don't really know um, exactly what it was. But, but later Cassini, um, uh, Giovanni Cassini, who was Italian, but then moved to Paris to run the Paris Observatory. He had better telescopes, bigger telescopes, and uh, he was able to look at Jupiter in more detail. And uh, he detected the rings of Saturn, but he monitored this spot that he saw on Jupiter. And over the years, um, the, these spots were recorded by, by astronomers looking at Jupiter. Note that when you look at uh, Jupiter with a telescope, um, with your own eye through the telescope, it appears to look upside down. So they drew the spot on the, the north of the um, planet. So it gets a bit confusing when you compare different views, but we'll come back to that in a bit. So what they did was they looked to these astronomers early days with their telescopes, looking at the belts and zones, labeling them, naming them, looking at the spot, watching it move around. But then for some reason, the spot was unrecorded after about 1713 for about 118 years. And it may be because they got distracted looking at careful motions of the planets, careful motions of the moons and trying to understand the dynamics. Um, or maybe they just didn't have very good telescopes or they weren't interested. But the interest returned in looking at the features on Jupiter in about uh, 1831 when much better telescopes. And over the years, these pictures are all taken around the time of World War I, um, uh, just before and, and, and after, uh, looking at Jupiter and, and carefully drawing in the uh, great red spot, looking at the belts and zones, looking at the markings and they're moving and changing with time. And indeed, if one records where the great red spot was moving, meandering around, drifting left and right, uh, you can see in this plot that goes back to uh, 1831 through to 1955. This is put together by a British astronomer uh, in his book in 1958. And uh, what he noticed was that the Great Red Spot seemed to rotate one way for a while, drift one way, then drift back the other way, and so on and so forth. So over a period of these 124, 24 years, it's, it's gone around in different directions quite a bit. It's drifted a lot. Now, um, later, one can, on comes photography and people take pictures. And indeed, that's much easier, maybe than drawing very carefully. But I'm not sure you actually record clearly the, until the photography got better much later. But at this period, you know, drawing versus taking photographs, it wasn't clear which gave you more information. So now let's talk about the space era. And I want to talk about Voyager. Uh, and um, Voyager 1 flew past Jupiter in March of 1979. Now, I have to say Pioneer did fly by before but the cameras on Pioneer were really not very good and they didn't see a whole lot. So let's just skip over Pioneer and move to Voyager. And in Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, both uh, flew past Jupiter in 1979 and it had cameras on, on board. And I was a graduate student at the time working with a plasma instrument, which is down here on the side and then the cameras are over here. And um, uh, it was taking these pictures uh, as it approached and went by. Now, I remember this picture, very beautiful picture of the Great Red Spot, the detail that we had not seen before, and it was printed on the front page of the New York Times the next day. But of course, no internet then, this was print page 
and it was black and white. Um, and um, there it is. You can see the great red spot on the front page of the New York Times uh, in Sunday, March 4th, 1979. Not a lot of detail, but it was the best we could do at that time. Now look at this movie. This movie was taken on approach by Voyager 1. It's 66 images. And as you approach, of course, it gets bigger and bigger in the field of view. But the pictures were taken uh, once per rotation because Jupiter rotates every 10 hours. And so you have to put together um, a snapshot and put them all together to show how over a period of about six days, the great red spot goes around. Now, there's so many things to look at here. You can see the drifting of the various dark spots and the white spots. You can see um, the, the um, belts and zones going in different directions. You can see the great red spot going around. You can see the turbulence around the great red spot. You can even see that sometimes the great red spot has a, an eddy that comes and goes around it. And sometimes the eddy gets swallowed up by the great red spot. So have a look, there it goes around, goes around. Oop, that one got gobbled up, right? So it's interesting, it's changing and there's, there's momentum and so on being exchanged and gases and materials between the surroundings and the great red spot, even in this picture that came from Voyager. Now, this was another nice picture, one of my favorites. It's got Eo, the, the volcanic moon um, that is sort of orangey color because of the sulfur on the surface. And then we have Europa, that's the one that may have life inside with an ocean on the outside. Uh, this was the original picture, but it's since been reprocessed. It's amazing how people take these pictures and work with them and reprocess them and make them look a lot clearer and a lot more um, detail and play with the color. We'll come back to color in a minute. Here's another one that's been reprocessed and you can see Europa down here. You can maybe see some of the, um, the, the markings on the surface, the ice has cracked. And whoops, sorry, let me go back. And there's the shadow of Europa on this, on, on, in the clouds of uh, Jupiter. But you can see here again, the great red spot, the turbulence around it, interaction with eddies, uh, with this red in the center. This is another reprocessed photograph, really quite remarkable how um, the, the modern um, image processors can take these pictures and do so much more with them. Now, the color looks a little strange here. We've gone through all sort of range of colors. What's the real color? What does it really look like to your eyes? And what does color mean when we're looking at an atmosphere? So the Cassini spacecraft, when it flew to, to Saturn, did this gravity assist at Jupiter. And the um, PI of the camera, Carolyn Porco, made a big effort to really make sure that the color was, was sort of as your eye would see it with the camera and how to adjust the colors and get it. And, and um, this is um, portrayed to be one of the, what your eye would really see if you were there looking at it. Again, there's a, uh, a black shadow of one of the moons, but you can see the great red spot is red. It's a sort of orangey color. It's not sort of screaming red at you at this time. This is the great red spot as taken by Juno. We'll come back to Juno in a minute, but I wanted to just show you, um, it actually does look redder. And um, this is portrayed to be realistic colors at the time of Juno. So how do we get these colors? What's happening here? Remember the atmosphere is 99% hydrogen and helium. Those are colorless gases. They don't make it look colored. So what you have to do is take UV light from the sun, which is each photon has a fair amount of energy and that's able to break up the molecules in the atmosphere. So you have uh, ammonia in the upper layers, you have some ammonia hydrosulfate, maybe a bit of water coming up and these pieces get broken up, right? The molecules get broken up, then the pieces come back together and they make different molecules, maybe bigger molecules. And those can form aerosols, come together to form liquid aerosols. Um, and uh, sometimes they're colored. So I uh, was hiking the other day and looking out towards Denver in the middle of winter, you can see when it's cold that there's this brown cloud over Denver and it's photochemical reactions working, UV light, working with the, the chemical atmosphere, chemi chemicals in the atmosphere. And of course, over the city, there's a lot of pollution as well. 
and it makes these aerosols, these colored aerosols. So when you see the great red spot, think of the brown cloud over Denver. So what is, what makes the colors that we call that a chromophore, chromo being color and four making, making. Uh, what, what chemicals are responsible for these colors? So um, the first idea is to say, well, let's have UV, but with, ho with um, ammonia hydrosulfide. And you make sulfides, right? And sulfur is yellow, right? Isn't that what you do? And I, until I started researching on the Great Red Spot for this talk, that's what I thought was the case. But I heard that Bob Carlson, who's a colleague, who, who a scientist who works in the lab at JPL, trying to do experiments to find out how the chemistry reacts to light, how various elements react to light. And he um, zapped some ammonia hydrosulfide with UV and it got lime green, not what we expected. So it's not the lime green, great red, great lime green spot. It's a great red spot. So there's something wrong here. So then he said, well, let's add acetylene because these hydrocarbons like acetylene, C2H2, come up from below with the ammonia and, and comes up in the moist uh, vertical convection of the great red spot. And what they found is it makes this thing here, as you can see, it's a variety of different ones with different values of N and M. Uh, and you make this uh, material that is yellow, right? It absorbs blue light, makes it sort of yellowish. So it seems to look about right. Now it turns out these are called alkanes with an azo group. And I, you know, I'm not very good at chemistry. I don't remember what that really means, but you know, this is the formula. But what's interesting that I learned from Kevin, Kevin Baines, who's, who's worked on, on this, that this is the same as the yellow pigment that goes into making the uh, highway stripes the paint that goes on the highway. And it's also the yellow that goes in your inkjet printer. Isn't that amazing? So the great red spot is um, the same chemistry as the lines of the middle of the road and your inkjet ink. Very bizarre, Didn't, I would not have expected it. But then even more cool is the fact that it, it this happens only at the top layer of the great red spot. And so they call this the creme brulee model, okay? So creme brulee, top left dessert, really yummy, um, where you put sugar in and then you zap it with a hot flame to make this crust on the top. And in the same way, what happens with the creme brulee model for the great red spot is you have materials coming up from below in this swirling cloud and the photochemistry generates this material, our uh, Carlson chromophore, and it forms these, these, um, uh, th these aerosols in the dark aerosols in this very thin layer. And it turns out, um, that, but you do need to bring it up um, the acetylene from below. But the question is, how much of this do you need to make the coloring that we see? Well, I did some experiments to give us some sense of concentration because, you know, I can give you numbers, but I want you to get a feel for this. So I took a glasses of milk and three glasses of milk and I put one bit of food dye, drop of food dye that I bought at the supermarket. And I put one drop on and five drops and 10 drops. And what you see is the difference in color, right? Obviously more dye, you get more color. Um, but what's interesting when you look at the numbers and you calculate the volume of a drop, the volume of the glass, that you get numbers like 140, 700, or 1400 parts of dye per million parts of milk. Okay, so think of that parts per million to get these dyes here. Now, what happens with the chromophores? These Carlson chromophores, it turns out that what you need in this creme brulee thin layer um, is in fact only 61 parts per billion, not million, billion, right? So a thousand times less. So it's a very, very efficient absorber of blue light. And it turns out it matches the lab spectrum. So this looks like indeed what we have is this acetylene coming up, reacting uh, with the sunlight coming in, reacting with ammonia to make these chromophores. Now it's not quite as simple as that because if you look in more detail, 
um, as here are two researchers who've looked at the light, different filters or, or using spectroscopic studies, looking at the great red spot and comparing it with the color of the red band. So on the top left, you've got a typical visible spectrum, visible view of Jupiter, and you have um, the comparison with different filters. And you can see that the great red spot is not the same as the redness of the belts above um, and below the equator. So there's something else going on that has to be other chromophores as well as the Carlson chromophore. Now let's think a little bit about structure. Um, we have the great red spot going around every um, six days. This is the time of Voyager, a tape, movie taken over many days, and you can see it's about the size of two Earths at this time. Of course, the color's a little off. We didn't get the camera right, but don't worry about that. But the dynamic shows you that what you have is a high pressure zone and you have anti-clockwise motion around um, in the Great Red Spot. Now, it turns out that if you look at um, the Great Red Spot here, you have this um, uh, high pressure storm in the Southern Hemisphere and around the pole of Saturn, you also have a low pressure storm, but it's going the other way, okay? You have a low pressure storm and it's uh, going the other way, okay? So uh, what we have here is both in the Southern Hemisphere, Jupiter's Great Red Spot is an anti-cyclone, Southern Hemisphere going this way, and the Northern, in, and the Southern polar vortex of Saturn is a cyclone. So let me remind you a little bit of how this works. If you have moist air, it rises, cool air descends. We talked about that before. Moist air usually is carrying material that then condenses to make the cloud. And um, that what happens is when you have high pressures high up, you have divergence of air, the upper layer. Remember, we're looking down on Jupiter, so we tend to think about what's happening in the outer layers of this system. Uh, whereas in the clear skies, um, you, you tend to have a low pressure and materials coming in, convergence. Now, if you add rotation, which is the Coriolis effect, in the Northern Hemisphere, you get cyclones going around anti-clockwise and anti-cyclones going around clockwise. Yes, I know it's hard to get your brain around that. I have to look it up on Wikipedia every time. Um, but in the Southern Hemisphere, it goes the other way. And so the cyclones go clockwise, anti-cyclones go anti-clockwise. And this is what we have with the Great Red Spot. So this one down here, is what we have, a high pressure zone and anticyclone, southern hemisphere. Now this more detailed picture um, gives in a lot more of the details of, of what we think is going on in this, this structure, um, where you have convergence at the bottom and you have warm moist air going up, carrying up um, um, water, ammonia, um, acetylene and so on up high and then it spreads out and then descends around the sides um, coming down and cools. And of course, at the top, we have our creme brulee layer at the very top, up at about uh, 0.2 um, Earth atmospheric pressures at about 0.2 bars. Now, let's think about the size of this great red spot. At the time of Voyager, it was about two Earths in size uh, across, and, um, but we don't know how deep it is. And so if it's about 300 kilometers deep, say, just a number people are sort of guessing, it would be this sort of aspect ratio. So really pretty thin. You gotta keep thinking of this as really thin. And um, if it's a, a thousand kilometers deep, then it would be more like this aspect ratio, but it's still pretty thin compared with the atmosphere. And indeed, if we look at the scale and we take Jupiter and we take um, even a really thick, a uh, deep uh, great red spot of a thousand kilometers, the depth is still only one seventy tooth of the radius of Jupiter. So the atmosphere is still very thin. We have to keep thinking of that. Now for scale compared with Earth, let's take Hurricane Katrina and you get a sense of the scale. You've got a sense of the maximum wind speeds, 175 miles an hour. That just sounds so destructive as it was. Um, but you can see when you compare it, it, it's tiny in comparison with the Great Red Spot on Jupiter. And indeed, the wind speeds are a lot less. Jupiter, we've got 260 miles an hour um, winds around the edges of the Great Red Spot. 
So there have been observations taken for many years um, by professionals and amateurs. Uh, this is a picture by an amateur, Damien Peach, taken with his telescope in his backyard. He travels around the world actually and takes some lovely pictures posted on APOD sometimes. But these citizen scientists, I actually reluctant to use the word amateur because these guys are quite incredible. Um, the, um, the, the citizen scientists uh, look through the telescope and monitor the structure and record it very carefully and uh, measure the locations of the motions. And um, John Rogers has done, who's written a great book on this uh, and, and monitored them for many years. And here is one of his amazing pictures. You can imagine someone looking through their telescope in their backyard with a little sketchbook, drawing out these structures on, the, on Jupiter and then turning them into this amazing diagram. So this geography, not geography, but geography, it has been put together by these citizen scientists and it's really quite remarkable. Uh, in particular, when we look at, this, at the Great Red Spot and its variation with time, you can see here that it can go from uh, large and extended to round. And these, um, uh, these observations have shown changes uh, shrinking and circularizing over a period of about 100 years. Uh, furthermore, it's been shrink, as I said, shrinking. You can see it's gone from about um, three times the size of the Earth, got up to nearly five times the size of the Earth, and then shrank down again uh, towards about two, or one and a half times the size of the Earth. And again, moving, drifting around the planet, up and down, uh, around, forwards and backwards, around the planet. So uh, is the great spot disappearing, right? Size seems to be changing. And so um, we can talk a little bit about the most recent observations associated with the Juno mission. So Juno has been, uh, is, a, is a spacecraft that's been in orbit around Jupiter for many years now, several years, and it's powered by a solar panel. It spins every 30 seconds. Uh, and so there are cameras on it. I'm gonna focus here entirely on the Juno cam, which is a citizen science camera, really amazing pictures it's been taking. GRAM, which is an Italian infrared uh, imager, spectrometer, and the microwave, MWR, um, which takes pictures at different microwave uh, wavelengths. So Juno has been in orbit since the 4th of July 2016. It's made 31 passes past Jupiter, and its orbit is 53 days. So it comes in, it goes very quickly in two hours from pole to pole, and then it spends the rest of the 50 days away from Jupiter. So we just get these very short little glimpses um, up close occasionally every 53 days or so. So when we look at different wavelengths, we see different things. And infrared is a picture from ground-based telescope. What you see is heat. And so you can see that the dark areas here in infrared are actually the white clouds, which are cold and very high. And when you see bright in the infrared, you're looking deeper in towards the planet when it's hotter. So the infrared covers um, something like the top 60 or so kilometers and is able to look through and around the, the ammonia cloud. But if you look in microwaves, you can go a lot deeper down to maybe 200 kilometers, much, much deeper, much higher pressures. And uh, Juno has six different wavelengths and is able to measure the heat coming out and the absorption of that heat coming out and map out um, the uh, composition of the outer layers. So here is a really cool movie of the Juno GRAM um, uh, five micron imager and you can see um, the colder areas so that at these altitudes, the great red spot is quite cold at the top of the cloud layer. Um, and then you can see um, the, the cold equatorial regions and the hotter belts. Now, when we look at the microwave, what we found was a big bit of a surprise in that um, it was not uniform in any way. There's a big variation with latitude in these um, belts and zones. And indeed, if you look at this movie of a multiple flybys, it does not look like a belt and zone structure. And it does not like, look like a simple layers of clouds. Um, so compare this with the picture that I showed you before, uh, the textbook picture of what the clouds look like. It doesn't seem to look like that. So. It's not as simple as the textbooks. Surprise, surprise. So let's look at the um, animation that Juno has put together. And it shows um, different colored bands. And uh, this is the movie showing you the belts and zones. And what we don't know is how deep these belts and zones go. 
Um, and what we're learning with Juno using uh, gravity and microwave is that these penetrate quite deep, maybe as much as 3000 kilometers. And so underneath there seems to be a fairly static, very slow moving material inside. Uh, and the big question is, how does the interior couple to the outside? And what's the relationship to the great red spot? Okay, so what did Juno see with the great red spot? Ta-da! Well, this is what the artists thought they saw or had fun with. Um, the scientists, of course, were a bit more serious and they looked at the great red spot in a variety of different ways. Remember, we're moving very fast over the top, get a, a quick snapshot every time we spin, every 30 seconds, and then put these pictures together. And many of these pictures have been put together and processed by amateurs. They're doing a fantastic job here. And you can see here in this amazing close-up view, the turbulence around the edges of the great red spot. You can see structure within the great red spot. And um, we're seeing that from orbit to orbit, there are changes and it appears to be, it's still shrinking. So uh, it's now, Voyager, it was two Earth radii. Now it's more like one and a half. And um, this is the color, again, giving you a sense of the, the color, but, but let's look at this movie, um, which was put, it's an animation really, rather than as an, an actual staring movie, put together by taking um, rotation information with, with images and you can see there's a lot of structure in there, eddies within eddies um, inside. And so we're learning a lot about the structure of the Great Red Spot by looking up close and also looking at different wavelengths. So this is the um, microwave signature of the Great Red Spot. And we see that it's actually, you can sort of see there's a signature that extends maybe down to 300 kilometers. So this is a big, interest here now in thinking about how does the dynamics work and, and um, how can you be driving this great red spot um, so deep. When we look at the surface in high detail, we can see all sorts of structures here. You can see some pop up fresh ammonia clouds. You can see dark uh, regions where you're looking deeper inside. You see in, in interactions with the surrounding environment there's waves here, all sorts of really interesting structure that the uh, scientists are trying to analyze and understand the details of the dynamics uh, in the Great Red Spot. Here we're combining a Juno image at the top um, with a, uh, a citizen scientist, John Rogers, again, looking again at the structure and how does this relate to previous observations of Jupiter and what's going on. Mentions here flake. There is some evidence that bits of the Great Red Spot flake off. It's not a very technical term, but it's basically interaction of the Great Red Spot, mater Red Spot material with the surroundings. And maybe this is related to it shrinking. So um, here again is that Hubble picture and showing you not just, it's, it's a lot redder. This is somewhat exaggerated, a little redder, rounder um, than before. And this is a very recent view showing you very similar to the Voyager in many ways, um, but the rate red spot has changed quite a bit since the time of Voyager. And when we look in the infrared, these are some ground-based observations used uh, in comparison with, with the Juno observations. You can see temperature when you look in the infrared. You can also see different chemistry. So distribution of ammonia, um, which seems to be non-uniform here. And then phosphine, uh, uh, pH three, in the great red spot, maybe somewhat related to the current, who knows? And again, uh, also aerosols detected. So we're learning a lot by looking at the great red spot in Jupiter's atmosphere in a variety of different ways, different wavelengths. And although Juno just gets this occasional snapshot every 53 days, um, the observations from um, telescopes uh, are giving us context and variability in structure. So here is from Amy Simon Miller, observations put together of the Great Red Spot, starting the bottom left at the time of Voyager, top right with the more recent HST observations. And you can see the changes in color and structure and shape over that time. We can quantify this and see, is it really disappearing? And what Amy Simon Miller did is that she put together a measure of length. And so you think of the Great Red Spot, how much it is across, 
and it's measured on the left-hand scale with these black dots is length and it's gone from being about 40 degrees of longitude down to about um, uh, 13. Uh, the, the red, ignore the red points, those are, that's the drift. It doesn't seem to have varied a whole lot. But if you compare it with the size of the Earth, you can see that since the 1880, it's gone from being nearly 40 times the size of the Earth down to this 1.4 times the size of the Earth. You can draw a rough line through this to make some wild conjectures. And this is what I did last night, just for fun. I took this more recent observations and I said, well, if it keeps shrinking at this rate, when will it disappear? And the answer is, well, somewhere around 2080 or so-ish, if it keeps shrinking at the current rate. But who knows? Maybe it'll come back. We don't know. So I want to end with a, uh, one uh, more recent uh, couple of studies that, that were presented at AGU and discussed at AGU. Um, there is this idea that maybe the deep convection in the dynamo region could be coupling to the atmosphere. Because when they do models of the atmosphere, all of the cyclones and anticyclones seem to disappear. They actually only tend to make cyclones. So um, the idea is that people have been looking at, maybe if you had some of the deep convection and you had a, a vortex penetrating up from below, um, could it be making the great red spot? And these are just very recent ideas, um, uh, but it might be a way in which you're going to have a long lasting great red spot is because you've got the long lasting internal cir cir um, circulation uh, sending a vortex up. Why? How? Uh, who knows? But this is an interesting new study to watch. So um, to summarize uh, what we've been um, doing here with the great red spot, it's been observed um, for about 190 years. It seems to be an upwelling of moist air, anticyclone storms consistent with, with that, those structures. It's on the order of one to three times the size of the earth. Uh, it seems to have been shrinking over the past decades. Um, the latitude range has not changed a whole lot, but the longitude range has helped, so it's become more circular. Um, the speeds around the edges have increased, it seems to be going a little faster um, and more interaction maybe with the surrounding, we don't know, but that maybe just we're looking a little more carefully or closely with better imaging. The color seems to be associated with photochemistry and we've identified one of the possible chromophores or types of chromophores, um, but maybe there are other chem chemicals that could be contributing to the color at different places on Jupiter. Uh, the microwave signature from Juno suggests a depth of around 300 kilometers or so. Um, there are gravity measurements. We flew over greater of the Great Red Spot, measured the gravity, and those results are embargoed. I can't tell you what they are, but watch the press. There will be soon release press releases coming out um, um, to say what they are. Um, actually, there was a press release this week saying Juno's mission has been extended. So we have another five years of observations and we really hope to be making many more observations of the Great Red Spot, gravity measurements, microwave measurements, imaging, infrared, and so on. And I'm sure the ground-based astronomers will be observing too. So the last piece is this new idea that there could be the source of the Great Red Spot could be coupling to the deep convection. And the big question is, is it going to disappear or is it going to grow back? Um, we will see. So I'm going to leave you with this movie, um, taking Juno images, put them together. I have my thanks to many people who helped me in putting this together. And with that, I will happily answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, that was a great, great, great talk. Um, we have a couple questions that have come in so far. Um, please feel free to type your Q&A, uh, well, your question in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, so we have a question that says, since Jupiter's mostly hydrogen and helium, why hasn't it become a star? Ah, 
So Jupiter is a failed star. It's about 20 times too small. It needs much more mass in order to start the fusion inside that produces the glow of a star. But it's a very successful planet. It's the biggest planet in our solar system. And it has about 90% of the mass or more than 90% of the mass of all the planets in the planetary material in our solar system, apart from the sun. Okay, um, and then there's a question of, um, is there only one red spot? There's only one big red spot that persists for centuries. I mean, we've been monitoring it for the past 190 years, but it could well be the same as the red spot that Galileo observed and before telescopes could have been there a lot longer. We don't know, um, but it's the only one that's lasted a long time. There's other ones that are come and go on a much shorter time frame, um, but yeah, it's, a, it's an anomaly. So there's a question of how can it be an anticyclone if the gases are rising? Okay, so you have to be a little bit careful about when your viewpoint in that on Earth, we think about what's happening at the bottom of the clouds, because that's where we are. We're at the bottom of the clouds. When you look at a planet from the outside, you've got to think about what's happening from the outside. And, and so um, I'm going to go back, if I can, and show you that diagram um, earlier. Um, yes, here we go. Um, so you've got to, to think about um, the difference between your viewpoint up here and you're looking down from the viewpoint if you're walking around at the bottom. And so I had to be very careful putting these together to give you that perspective. I hope that helps. And don't get all confused with the Coriolis going left and right. Okay. Hope that helps. Um, wow, 24 Q and A's. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what are the conjectures with respect to the standing heat source that drives the great red spot? And any idea of the role of the phase change of like water vapor, like in a hurricane? Um, yeah, so that's a good point. And, you know, I was somewhat, um, you know, there's, so there's two ideas. One is the recent idea of the stuff coming from below. And so here you would have a vortex from the deep interior, from the dynamo re region, um, sort of bursting up through the outer layers. Very recent, not clear that this is what's happening, but it's clear there's plenty of momentum deep down and vorticity deep down and that may uh, with less dissipation. Whereas once you get up into the atmosphere above, you get, get more, more dissipation. Um, this diagram, which is really quite complicated from Lee Fletcher, perhaps gives you um, a better idea of, yes, I mentioned water, for example, coming up um, because we think that there is indeed lightning, which may play a role in the photochemistry. Um, we've only flown over once and it took 10 minutes and we didn't see lightning, but we're going to do multiple flies over with Juno and maybe we will see more lightning. So there could be uh, water coming up and, and uh, drops coming down and generation of lightning. Um, there is certainly latent heat involved with um, the updrafts. And so in some ways, um, the processes that we have here on Earth are probably similar at uh, Jupiter. It's just it's more complicated. We don't just have water ice. We've also got ammonia hydrosulfide and ammonia ice, and um, it makes it more complicated. But um, there is also a recent publish, this again last year, and go check out the LASP seminar that we did, not a public seminar, but a LASP seminar, that was uh, given by Tristan Guillo, and he talked about these mush balls, which is the idea of having an ice hail falling down in a storm 
and ammonia going around it, forming this big thing, the size, you know, about this sort of size, the size of a, of a baseball um, falling through the sky. And um, we, we've got, Juno is developing some evidence of that sort of action happening. So yes, whoever asked that question, you're right on it. There's, that's a large, that's a, a factor. Sorry for taking so long. Okay, so there's a couple of questions that I'm just going to put into one question. Um, there's questions about the possibility of a probe or something, a future satellite that would fly in and maybe sample the atmosphere in situ or um, would find out more about the internal parts of Jupiter. So when we proposed Juno at the time, um, everybody wanted to go back and do more probes. We'd had the Galileo probe, which happened to go into a rather unfortunate area that was particularly hot and very dry. And everyone said, where's the water? Where's the water? There's got to be water inside. And so this provoked um, a follow on mission. And we proposed not to do a probe with Juno, but to do the microwaves because we thought mapping out the microwaves will tell us about the water inside and the ammonia inside in multiple places. The problem with a probe is you only go in one place or you have to have multiple probes going into different places and that's expensive. And so now that we've done the work with Juno that gives us some sense of the depth and the distribution of material, we now know these are the interesting places or people can propose to send probes to Jupiter now and say, I wanna go here, I wanna go there. And the reason is much more based on previous observations and what we've learned through Juno. So follow on, yeah, maybe some probes down the road. Okay, so uh, the next question, um, I've had a couple of questions about what we know about the core of Jupiter. Okay, so I, um, that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> but, um, and indeed, there is a recorded public talk probably that I gave on this topic previously about Juno, but we've got more results coming out. And what we're finding is that indeed there is a metallic hydrogen region. We know we can tell this from the gravity measurements, but what we do know is that there isn't a strict separate boundary between the rocky uh, heavy element core and this metallic hydrogen, we think that the heavier elements are more mixed in with the metallic hydrogen. So the iron, the sulfur, the oxygen, the um, silicon and so on and so forth um, are dissolved as atoms probably in the metallic hydrogen, but mixed out and not just this bottom quarter of it, but maybe up to 50 or 60% of the radius like this. And so these are new results that are just being published and we they're trying to be modeled and people are trying to understand them. And at the AGU, there were a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions about this and uh, a lot of interesting things. So this is sort of turned, uh, stirred up the field um, and uh, got us all thinking about how to make Jupiter and make it the way it is as we observe it. So um, uh, it's much more mixed up. The total amount of um, water in, in, or the total amount of oxygen in, Jupiter is still up in the air. Is it uh, about the same as solar or as much as five times solar? We don't know uh, where it is. That's what we're working on. Um, so speaking about new observations coming out, there's a question about um, what is planned in the extended mission, if, if you can talk about that at all. Right. So we will continue to make observations in the extended mission. Let me just bring up the um, trajectory, um, which is here, right. Um, so we've had perijobes one through 31, and we're going to go uh, with the extended mission. If the spacecraft stays healthy, uh, we hope to get 70, 70 few, maybe, we'll see. Um, the thing though is because of Jupiter being uh, flattened at the equator, it spins so much, it's fatter at the equator than on the poles. Um, this causes the orbit to, to move down. And so here the orbits look like this, but they're moving so that they will go down like this, okay? And so this has a couple of implications. One is our viewing geometry will change. 
Um, but also it means that we will eventually get into Jupiter's nasty radiation belts. And uh, that may start to impact our electronics and affect our measurements. But it also means that we will get closer to the plane uh, that has the satellites. So we do hope to get measurements of Ganymede, uh, uh, Europa, and eventually some of EO um, and getting close and makes those measurements. And we also uh, make measurements over the poles of the Aurora and so on. So more of the same, um, but focused more on the satellites, focused on going over the Great Red Spot. We hope to have two or three more flybys of the Great Red Spot and um, then going more detailed measurements over the poles. We'll also get higher resolution of the magnetic field and the gravity measurements, and that'll tell us more about the interior. Okay, great. Um, so there's a question about um, the size of the spot and your timeline of, of disappearance might disappear. And so if you were to extrapolate that shrinking line backwards or back up right. in size, would you reach a size point where you cannot maintain a into cyclone? Oh, does that on. match a time when the yeah, GIS yeah. does not appear in history? Yeah, now that's a great point. Um, now we weren't really measuring them a whole lot before. Now let me let you, so this one, okay, let's look at these numbers here. So these numbers at the, to the right are, quite, are, are sort of one and a half times the size of the Earth. And those were made with Hubble Space Telescope with Voyager and Galileo and so on. And then you go back to these earlier ones and these are telescopic. Now, I think there's more noisy, these are more noisy than it is indicated um, by these, the, these um, points. Um, and indeed, if we go back and we look at the historic observations that were put together, um, what we see there um, oops, I don't think I have them here. Let me have a quick look at the backup pictures. Sorry, it's quite useful to to look at these variations with time. No, nope, unfortunately, I don't have it. Um, it turns out, sorry, if we go back to the first observations in 1831, um, it didn't, this is about the biggest it ever got was around this time. And if you go back earlier, um, it wasn't quite so big. And so, you know, I think it's oscillated from the earliest times we've observed it around this larger size. And then it's only in the past hundred years that it seemed to be made a consistent downward spiral. Now, it's not clear that if you look on the larger scale, um, indeed, it could be that when we go to the, it, it, this could just go back up again. It's quite possible that it'll just come back again. Yeah, but that's a good, good question. But uh, yes, I mean, at some point it can't be huge, right? At some point you can't take over the whole planet. So there, there must be some limit, very important thing to investigate. Um, okay, there's a couple of questions about sending humans to Jupiter, um, what the radiation levels are and if that's a possibility. Um, okay. Several things. First of all, the radiation damage is nasty, 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 nasty. Forget it. No way, Jose. But the other thing is this. Why send humans? There's nothing that humans can do. The robots can't do better, cheaper, more efficiently. It's dumb. There's no point to send humans. Send our robots. Robots are much better. We can watch the robots. You can send multiple robots. We can observe what they see. And um, there's... There's no point sending humans. Sorry. Okay. That was a great answer. Um, uh, I think we're about done with all these questions. So I'm going to cut it off there. 
Um, okay. If anybody has questions that we didn't get to, um, please feel free to reach out to um, us through the Office of Communications and we can forward them on to Fran. Um, thank you so much, Fran, for a wonderful presentation and update on the Great Red Spot. Sure. I personally learned a lot. It's a pleasure. Um, thank you so much. And uh, Laura will be putting up a slide that shows our next lecture, which is next month, the first Wednesday of the month. Um, and uh, we hope that you can all uh, join us for that talk. And thank you so much for calling in. We had our highest attendance so far with about 200 attendees. So that was fantastic. And again, I extend our thanks to you, Fran. Uh, you're a wonderful, wonderful presenter and we thank appreciate you, you. Great pleasure to talk to everybody on this fun topic.